seminar on metaphysical science. Alexander is. Yeah, the Seminar. Yeah, Seminar. Yeah, Seminar on the metaphysical science. The last meeting. Uh, okay, my pleasure to. I, Alexander doesn't need a proper introduction because you already know it, but. Uh, pleasure for me to be Alexander give this last talk. So, Alexander, can you justify the introduction principle? If laws of nature are changed. Metaphysical answer. Okay. <laughs> so, since I'm replacing someone, I, I, I've put that together recently and. Yeah, it's still it's still a work in progress, and I've been sick all all week, so I, I'm a little bit lightheaded. So if you if you are confused by a sentence or I'm confusing, please stop me and ask for a specific questions. So the title is "Can we justify the induction principle if laws of changing the, if laws of nature are changing?" What what I will mostly answer is not a justification, but in what way the principle of induction could still be compatible or defendable if laws of nature are changing. So it's not it's not as strong as justification, it's more a compatibility discussion. Okay. So the plan will go like that. So first I will discuss a little bit how why it's a metaphysical perspective. There's many ways to do that, but I will just give an example of how Newton metaphysically justify inductive reasoning based on a met metaphysical consideration of the nature of the world, just to give you an example, a historical example. After that, I will go in the three basic metaphysical theory of laws to show how day to day they try to make uh, the kind of claim that Newton's was doing more clear, more solid. So a, a good conception of, a good con metaphysical conception of laws should be compatible with the principle of induction. It's like in the, <coughs> in the cahier de charge, that what, what you should do. Here, after that, I will discuss how this theory could be altered to have changing laws of nature, not in the very strong metaphysical sense, but in, the, in a way that makes sense of what the scientist, when the scientist says laws are changing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid here I present this result, all the result of the section three, two years ago in a paper published, but so I will go fast, except if there's a lot of people in the room that were not here two years ago. Okay, and at the end I will show that most, two out of my theory of metaphysical laws are incompatible with, with, the, with the induction principle, except one, so one survives. <laughs> but I will not tell you before the end. <laughs> <laughs> you, you will guess during the process. <laughs> and I, I was surprised about that. I thought the three of them would die. Okay, so just to, to flex our philosophical muscles, how do uh, an example of how a, a famous scientist, famous uh, natural philosopher, justifies induction reasoning based on a certain conception of nature? So, in the, the third book of the Principia, it's the only part where Newton is discussing a, a little bit of methodology. So, how to do inductive reasoning, how to to use experiments, blah blah blah. It's not. It's, it's two pages, so it's not really long, but still. And the rule one, the first rule of these rules of reasoning, no more causes of natural things should be admitted than are both true and sufficient to explain their phenomena. So it is a, a rule about inductive reasoning. You, when you find an you find explanation to a phenomena, you should not multiply causes. Why? And here is the part about conception of nature, the conception of nature. As the philosophers say, Nature do nothing in vain, and more causes are in vain when fewer suffice, 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 suffice. For nature is simple and does not indulge in the luxury of superfluous causes. So he says, you're justified to do that kind of inductive reasoning about the nature, the cause behind the phenomena, because nature is in a certain Nature is simple. Nature is nice. Nature does not do excess. 
Another famous case, and this one is even more, more known. In the rule tree, those qualities of body that cannot be attended and remitted, blah, 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 and that belong to all bodies and on which experiments can be made should be taken as qualities of all bodies universally. So what is saying that in this rule is that the qualities, the properties you identify in experiments could be extrapolated to very far away, very big, and very small on all scale. And why are you justified to do that? How, why could you, are you justified to extrapolate, to, induct, to make an induction based on what you measure in the laboratory? Because I know fancies are not to be fabricated recklessly against the evidence of experiment. Okay, that's epistemological. Nor should we depart from the analogy of nature, since nature is always simple and ever consonant with itself. The analogy of nature is an expression that was really studied by historian of, of science and philosopher of science. There's a very famous paper of McGuire about that that died two years ago, one year ago. And so it's because Newton believed that there's effectively an analogy of nature. So the properties here are not exactly the properties at small scale, but they are analogous. The properties here are also analogous to the property over there. So you are justified to do that kind of induction. You could be wrong, but you are mostly justified because nature is built in a certain way. So what you notice here is that it's not that clear. It's difficult to really point what kind of property, what kind of nature justify what kind of inductive reasoning. After that, all that was put under the rug and called the principle of uniformity. So in Mill and all these guys, it's all inductive reasoning is justified because of principle of uniformity, whatever that means. Nature is is a dense effect. Nature is the way it is, and it's why we're justified to do science inductively. Okay. So now I will present three classical, it's always the three same that I present in every of my talk in the last two years, so I'm very sorry about people <laughs> that already know that part. But I will show explicitly how these three theories of metaphysics of laws try to have a better way to say exactly the same thing as Newton. They will put things explicitly in their theory to guarantee or at least to mitigate the skepticism about inductive reasoning. So when, when a metaphysician builds a theory of metaphysical theory of laws, of course, there's, they want to justify counterfactual reasoning, they want to explain science, they want to do, but also they want to be compatible with the fact that inductive reasoning function in the world. So they would like to have something like a metaphysical explanation of inductive reasoning. So let's look at the regularism at Alalewis. So I know that most of you are familiar with this theory, but uh, yes, so I can go fast, slow. <laughs> okay, Julien does not, so I will. Uh, no, no, but that's okay, that's okay, it's why there are slides. So it's so just, I don't want to bore people, but if you don't know, I will explain. So what is a law according to the, the Lewis version. So a contingent generalization is a law of nature. Okay? Is a law of nature. It's a it's a equal, it's a very strong claim. If and only if it appears as a theorem or axiom in each of the true deductive systems that achieve the best combination of simplicity and strength. So the best the best system to describe the world, the best deductive system to describe the mosaic of facts, so all the facts, past, present, future. The best system according to simplicity and strength. All the axiom of the system in the theorems are laws of nature. Of course, it's not enough just to say that to well-define 
the system of law of nature. So, so to be able to justify counterfactuals and all the things we want natural laws to do, Lewis had to add at least, and it depends on the list, depends on the people, the philosopher, at least five other metaphysical hypotheses. And we'll look at them because you will see how most of them favor inductive reasoning. So first, Lewis presumed that there's a mosaic of facts. So you can, there's a way to represent all the facts, past, present, future, and it's called the mosaic of facts. I will not discuss the details of what are facts. For him, it's mostly instantiated, instantiated natural properties, but we can discuss about the notion of facts. There's Maybe we should not discuss that in Lewis, but, but there's a mosaic of facts. And these regularities supervenes on the mosaic of facts. First, metaphysical hypothesis. Fundamentalism. Perfectly natural property properties form a unique set of properties whose instantiation constitute the bedrock ontology of the human world, the mosaic of facts. For such a bedrock, other derivative existence obtained through supervenience. So we have a number, a finite number of natural, kind of natural properties, and they are the thing instantiated in the mosaic of facts, because it's finite, because everything derived from them, if we know them, if it's possible to know them, we're able to do science. Physicalism. Perfectly natural properties are physical and should therefore be identified and identified identifiable as such by physics. So it's an explicit hypothesis that the properties of the world are knowable. So that, that, that's good for the principle of induction. It's like the property of the world are knowable. Why? Because they are. Physics is good. Physics is the way. <clears throat> Why physics, not biology? Because of the moment he was writing, I'm quite sure. <laughs> and the people he knew. Three. Meteorological reductionism. Non-perfectly natural properties, for example, biological one, for example, reduced to perfectly natural properties. Such a reductionism immediately follows from a strong interpretation of supervenience to the effect that emergent properties are ipso facto to be excluded. We exclude a priori. Um, uh, synchronic emergence. Because that would put in danger the inductive principle. If suddenly in the mosaic something completely new appear, problems. So, does not exist. Yes? That seems more like a counterexample is hyperlink. Emergence. You said synchronic. Yeah, it, yeah but here the meteorological reductionism is, is really uh, synchronic. It's yeah, to say that no. every properties, you know, higher level biological properties, are just supervene on physical properties. So the appearance you're talking about is synchronic. Yeah, it's the but yeah, in a certain sense. But it's if you don't have that, if I see perfectly natural properties now. In future, the perfectly natural property will not have a non-supervenient new properties over them. So I'm justified to do science now. I have, it's not perfect because maybe I didn't see anything, some part of the mosaic, but at least the properties we are measuring now are the ones that will exist in the future. Necessarily, according to that. Eternalism. Past, present, and future facts are ontologically on par to the effect that there is no genuine becoming in typical human worlds. This usually translates as a block universe, but not always. Mm -hmm. Not always. Depends of the of the of the kind of Lewis you're defending, but but it guarantees that the future facts exist in the same way that the, the, the past facts and the actual facts, so the mosaic, the best system is really describing all the mosaic, even right now, yeah, at least in principle. Even if us, we are in the mosaic at a certain position right now. Metaphysically, future facts have a status. 
fast facts have a similar status. And finally, universalism, the best system, there's one of them. It's the same everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> there's one. And the regularities that, that are identified in the best system span on all the mosaic. Not, oh, there's one just at the end of the mosaic. There's the regularities that suddenly appear at the end of the mosaic. It's impossible to predict from anywhere in the mosaic that it's excluded. And you see how these five principles guarantee inductive reasoning. They, they, are, they don't make it necessarily efficient, but at least they are compatible with some inductive principle. Because they say that you, there's no privileged position in the mosaic, the properties that we are measurable, the properties that we know are the properties that will, that will still be the properties in the future, all kind of nice stuff to protect the principle of induction. Uh, yeah. Do they account for counterfactuals? Yeah, according to Lewis, with that, you can justify all counterfactuals reasoning. Even though they are e even though there's no real modality nowhere in the system. How does it have an impact on our possible worlds? Some metaphysician would say it's impossible <laughs> to justify counterfactual in the Lewis tradition. You know, Rodrigo, one of our past collaborators, was defending. Lewis built that explicitly to be able to justify counterfactual. How? Because he says this best system and this general structure of the mosaic allow you to justify a lot of counterfactual conditions. If I had did that, I would have get blah blah blah. Why? <coughs> because it fits with the best system. It's a deduction of the best system, for example. So it's a very epistemological way to, to see the thing, but that, that's on purpose in Lewis. It was built like that. After that, you can ask yourself how the same person that was realist about the possible world <laughs> decided to exclude modality completely of his real metaphysics. Yeah, this is something we should I ask to specialists of Lewis because it's the same guy that did exactly that. It's yeah. explicit. There's no model, explicit model properties in the world, in the actual world. The actual world is a mosaic of facts where every fact is on par. But these principles are maybe necessary. To, yeah. These principles, according to Lewis, are necessary to be able to justify counterfactuals and have all the nice properties, model properties you want to have. Um, model, not, not model properties. So while the laws themselves are general, by means of these principles, you can get model content yeah. in them? Yes. So based on the best, the best system, I could say, if in the future that I don't have access, I would have blah, blah, blah. Mm. I would obtain blah, blah, blah. Why? Because the best system exists mm -hmm. and justify this claim. Of course, my knowledge today of the best system is partial because we will have access to the best system only if we had all the mosaic, of course. But, I, but there's all kind of nice properties that guarantee that we are in a way to get to the best system. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Now, I'm strong conception of metaphysics of laws. Same questions? Okay. So, the idea of Armstrong is really to, to, to find a way to, for, the, for the intuition that law, the law governs their instance. For Lewis, the laws are not governing the, uh, their, their instance. The laws are just there to describe instances. Armstrong wants to get to something strong. The laws govern their instance, and he wants to have the idea that there could be other world with the same natural properties, but not the same laws. So he wants to have both, this both 
intuition. So he defines laws that way. Sentences like, it is a law that Fs are G, Gs, should be understood that it is physically necessary that Fs are Gs. So he will define physically necessary or some a special kind of necessitation. That will be represented like that. There's a necessitation relation that if F then G should be understood. Something being F necessitates that the same something being G in virtue of the universals F and Gs. So it's in the virtue of the nature of properties that they are governed in a specific way. Nature of the properties in our world, of course. Because in another world, the same properties we could maybe do something else. And that's it. Since relation among universals are timeless, necessary connection, this should protect me, protect his position against skepticism of the principle of induction. Because the properties described by the universals are always related in a certain way, necessary, that produce the same kind of instance regularly. So causal relation in the world are in fact just the effect of these of these connection between these universal. If there's enough of them, not very clear how much, but if there's enough of them, the world is regular. And that's it. It's enough to protect inductive reasoning, at least to be compatible with inductive reasoning. The world is completely irregular or it's sufficiently regular? <laughs> we can discuss in Armstrong, it's sufficiently regular. That may be completely irregular. Armstrong does not want to exclude some discovery of science that the world is, at least part of the world is not regular. That's possible. But it's sufficiently regular because there's su sufficiently necessitation relation to guarantee that we can do science. And of course, these, there's a privilege of the universal describing mm -hmm. natural properties, of course. That, that I forgot to put in the slides, but I'm a, there's, there could be all kind of universal related but all kind of necessities. But the one describing natural properties have this very nice regular structure. Okay? Disposition, essentialism. So if properties have dispositional essences, does that 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 bird, then certain relation of necessity will hold between the relevant universals. These relationships can be identified with the laws of nature. So it is necessary that if you have a certain disposition that if this this stimulus blah 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 right, occur automatically this manifestation on this disposition on the object X, if and only if it guarantees a certain conditional counterfactual. So it seems we see laws, regularities, but in fact these regularities are a byproduct of the action of disposition in the world. And these dispositions are the basic ontology. There could be other stuff. There are so many kinds of dispositionalists mm -hmm. dispositionalist today, but most of the dynamics, what is important to predict, to, to do an inductive reasoning, is in the, the action of the disposition. It's not always clear why you guarantee the principle of induction. I think in many dispositional lists, I think often they don't even try to argue for it. It's so obvious for them that if the world is governed by disposition, they don't need to argue for a principle of induction. So my guess is that they defend something very similar to Armstrong, but in Armstrong it's explicit. Mm -hmm. In the dispositional list, it's less explicit. I think. They believe that there's enough disposition at play, they are not too diverse, they are knowable, they make the world advancing somewhere, and if we know them or we begin to know them, we can do inductive reasoning. Okay. 
So you see how these three positions about laws of nature try to, to put a little bit uh, more precise than just to say nature is simple, nature is equal to itself, blah blah blah, nature is uniform. We are trying to, to give you good reason to believe that if the laws are described by these theories, induction is not due. Not automatically valid, but it's efficient, but it's not due. Actually, just one, yeah. one, one comment. I mean, it, it's, cl it's clear to me that in the Lewis case, you have to justify somehow the principle of induction because you don't have necessities in the world. Yeah. So to, to account for the regularization, you need to say something else. I'm going to say something about that probably at the end of the talk, but in, the, in, these, two, in these two views, the dispositionalist view and the governing view, since you have necessity in the, yeah. in the ontology, that's yeah. just automatically rejected. I mean, you are automatically yes. absorbing the principle of induction. Yes and no. I mean, uh, 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 the principle of induction could be just something very close to our way to know things, but it's obvious that yeah. we, we don't have. Uh, so, so what? It's much easier to argue. Yeah. I, I agree with you, but you still have to say that these necessities must be knowable. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they have to be numerous enough or strong enough or the same now than in the future, so there's not new necessity. This is very clear for the disposition, you know, there's no new disposition that will appear in the middle of nowhere in the future. Uh, and for, for, for it's explicit in Armstrong that there's no uninstantiation or very mm -hmm. instantiation in very late and very far in the future, new properties, not probable, or there won't be another, a lot of them. To guarantee. So yeah, you're right. It's much easier if you have already necessities in the world. You just have to argue that these necessities are knowable and strong yeah, 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 and strong enough yeah. and strong enough mm -hmm. to guarantee okay. inductive mm -hmm. principle. You're right. No, it's true. As you see, Lewis works much more. <laughs> it's very difficult to justify it. The mosaic of facts could be anything. Yeah, I'm, uh, something new that uh, always could come up at some point that just what you would be So, or in this so case, no, I mean, what was necessary yesterday is going to be necessary in the future as well. Exactly, it's why there's all these yeah, yeah, no, no, hypotheses. Okay, now, the possibility of changing laws. Uh, it will be just a part of this paper that was published, uh, when was it published last year? I will not present all the papers, just a few parts. I just have to say before that the goal of this paper was not to discuss changing laws for a metaphysician, but how we can change minimally the metaphysical theories I presented to accommodate something like changing laws for a scientist. So at the end, you will see, you will see that some of them are not really changing. Simulating changing laws. <laughs> it's it's making the thing looks like changing laws, but not really metaphysically changing laws. But still, they will put our arguments about the principle of induction in in difficult in strong difficulties. Okay. First comments. First remark. We want. We don't just want different laws at different location. We want changing laws and dynamical change, or changing a law becoming something else. If I say there's law governing electromagnetism here, and there's law governing nuclear blah 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 here, okay, doesn't change anything. Not interesting. Not really challenging for the principle of induction. There's a notion of local change and global change not really useful for this talk. Okay, so there's two conceptions of what is changing, but I mean, it won't be important for this talk. So let's look at Lewis. So to have something that looks like changing laws, we will work only, we will modify minimally the principle five and only the principle five. 
we'll try to keep the four order unchanging. So of course, we will not say there's this two, two best system because that will just kill the theory. <laughs> the cost is just ridiculous. We'll keep the best system, but we will weaken the second part that regularities necessarily spend supervene on all the mosaic. We will allow that some regularities could be rigid. So let's keep the unicity of the best system, but allows for possibilities that regularities do not spend on their whole supervening base. OK, is it incompatible with the best system? No. So at least for a limit case, we can prove that it's not incompatible with the best system. This is the argument for the limited, the limit case, which is not the interesting case, but it's interesting to just to show it's not incompatible. So imagine a W is a best system homological world where the list of axioms could be organized. I'm simplifying here between a part that is more factual and a part that is more dynamical, but it's just a way to organize the axiom. Just imagine now another world that is exactly like the first world, except in a negligible space-time zone. And this notion of negligible could be formalized. So it's a, of a Lebesgue le, uh, measure of zero compared to, to space-time. So there's two options for this new system. If this is the best system for W, or we keep this one for W1. We say, OK, this zone is so small that it's not worth it to ask an axiom. It's still the best system of expression, blah, blah, blah. Or we had an explicit description of the properties in this negligible zone. OK? We can do the same reasoning if we multiply these negligible region for infinity. If there's an infinite number of them, it's not a problem. If the measure of the sum of these region is still negligible compared to space time. So at least it's not impossible. It's not ir not reasonable to have to keep at. Uh, to still have a notion of best system, even if the, the, the regularities in your best system do not span on all the mosaic. There could be a lot of place where it does not fit. Uh, Alexander, when, when you say that, yeah. sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry. When you say that uh, W1 is like W. So it's the same mosaic, except in a very small region. But it, it, it has the... the, the, the there's a small variation, for example, in the observational uh, thing that you can have in one world. No, 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 no. In, in, it's not observational. It's in a region. It's not the same natural, perfectly natural properties. So there is something that should be captured by the uh, different regularity in this particular region. Yeah. Ah, okay. So because I was imagining something like okay, like the whole argument in the sense that you have two different uh, manifolds, and but in one there is a, a hole, and the other one is not a hole. But this hole is doesn't produce any, any observ observational change. No, so in some here, point this is here, a, and here, yes. I mean, you, and uh, you uh, just see different things in There's the different things okay, in the whole. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. exactly. OK, so this is an argument to say that it's not incompatible. On the other hand, it's not a very interesting case. The interesting case would be something like that. The mosaic is separated in two regions. And, and at least part of the axiom do not translate from here to here or the reverse. <coughs> so, or the mosaic cannot, can be represented by a disjunctive best system or not. And this, we just say we don't know. Okay? There's no proof our world is our world more this one or this one. We don't know. It will depend on the mosaic. But at least there is a possibility it's possible that we have a mosaic in such structure that the best system will be a disjunctive one. So there's some facts 
that will be shared. The dynamical loss here will not be the dynamical loss here. So there will be a regime change in the world. Yes? What, what's the case where it's not, it cannot be this generative? So there's two possibilities. If you have a mosaic like that, or you're able to find laws that cover all the mosaic but will behave in a very specific way in the different zones, or it's an authentic disjunctive system. Something applies here, something different applies here. We don't know that. Maybe there's a very clever way <laughs> to do the mosaic in the circuit, to do the best system, not to have this. So then there's no changing laws. In that case, there would be no changing laws. Ah, okay. But still, in this one, one, in this one, the best system is the same. It's not changing metaphysically. It's changing that way. So what would be changing the laws in the best system? It will be, there's a, a best system. Okay, there's one because it's not like this. And this best system is disjunctive. It cannot be reduced in another way. So at one point, you have a change of dynamical laws over the same properties, supervening on the same kind of properties. And that would be, from the mosaic point of view, changing laws. On the other hand, I don't know if our world is like that. Maybe our world, everything that looks like changing laws, or in fact, you could subsume them under a better best system. That's, that's possible. I don't know. But the best way to make sense of changing laws for scientists that would be compatible with the best system would be something like that. that it's a disjunctive best system. And I don't know if our world is like that at all. Yeah. This disjunctive one is not going to be predictive enough, right? Yeah, there will be problems. You can see already that there will be a lot of problems for the principle of induction. You always know either S or S star, but you want to know, like, under the red line. Yeah, you already see. You already see that if our world is like that, principle of induction is due. You already have my conclusion on this one. Okay. And one one question. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I get the concept, but it is it's hard to me to 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 see yeah. a more concrete. Example from I mean you're you're saying something like okay we, we, we live in a Newtonian world and our resistance for something like Newtonian mechanics and at some point we discover that in a small region okay. below some scale we have quantum mechanics and then you're saying okay is that junction between quantum mechanics and classical okay mechanics? let me give you an example okay let's imagine we have certain law of electromagnetism mm -hmm. certain electromagnetic phenomena and they work well so and if we are predictive, and we're quite confident that they are related to the best system. Uh, they are mm -hmm. in a good yeah. way. They, yeah. they, are, they work very well. They will be in the best system. Suddenly, the same properties behave com very differently. The same properties. Charge in certain contexts, certain condition, do something weird. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the, the electromagnetism will, it's still electromagnetism, it's still the same properties, but it's different. Okay. If we can subsume these two things under a more general best system, mm -hmm. it's not the case at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we cannot, and we still want to say, no, it's, it's still electromagnetism, it's still the same properties, it could be a disjunctive system. Okay, okay, yeah. So at the end of the mosaic, when we have the complete mosaic, if the best system is really this disjunctive thing, it's like we would say changing laws. If, oh no, 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 we discover that in fact we have more general way to build the mosaic, it won't be changing laws in that sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it better? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's better. But it must be the same properties. 
You know, it's not like electromagnetism and oh, something completely new. Mm -hmm. It must be the same properties. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I was wondering why you speak of the disjunctive case. Well, I guess there's good reason to exclude some kind of group like uh, solution, and not disjunctive, but say conjunctive, like before. Yeah. Then. The if, line if, is as after one is as if, if the best system is something like oh it was not electromagnetic property it was group yeah that, that, uh -huh. and it's the best system ah, it's the best system it's yeah, not Lewis, changing Lewis just bites that Lewis bites that bullet explicitly right it's at some point in introducing Lewis explicitly says that that could happen right for oh no I that, think that, with that, the group example even. that could act, that could happen the only thing is that these Things should supervene on the on the on the natural properties. That that's possible. If at the end the best system, the, the more compact best expression, is to go to these meta properties, no changing laws. It's just that we didn't know. Why would that be excluded? No, no, it's not necessarily excluded. We don't know. I don't know what would be the best system. Maybe the best system is not to add too many of these meta properties. Maybe the best system is to have simply juxtaposition of partial best system. I don't know. No, but I mean, if, if you can have a disjunctive one, yeah, it seems you can also have a yes, a but I'm, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm just saying that if you have if you want notion of changing laws. Okay, in Lewis, that's without killing Lewis, without killing the best system, it's something like that that you should aim for. On the other hand, maybe it's in our world we will never have that. That I don't know. I don't really see the contingency of that, but let's continue. <laughs> but that, that's the problem with the best system, is that we have no idea what is the real best system and what it yeah, will yeah, look yeah. like. Except it will be a deductive system with a finite number of axioms that will express a lot of stuff, hopefully. Maybe not everything, but a lot of facts. But what, 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 one one of the worst things of accepting stuff like the group case is that you have to formulate the laws in such a way that you are referring to a specific time and a specific yeah. moment, and that is a, something. It that will be some kind of contextual, maybe. It depends how you define. Group. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was I was going to expect that you exclude these solutions by saying you have never something in Mexico or something going on. Uh, you cannot refer to T. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the red line. If I would say that it's, in, it's true that you you might come to something like this, but before getting to something like this, you are going to go through uh, the. I mean, uh, have to uh, revise another example, everything. Uh, okay, another example. <coughs> maybe I should have put a slide. It's that if it's s s prime s s prime s s prime, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that you would say, ha ha. Because of the regularity of change, I don't need disjunctive system. I just have to have uh, a fluctuating pattern of, mm -hmm. of regularities. And that would surely be better for the best system than just tuck, tuck, tuck. So we have, to, yeah. we have to imagine a system where there's no, if we want changing laws, there's no more elegant way to express it in the best system. Okay. But of course, if it's a regular change, no, to, to, okay. uh, it will be a new law. <laughs> it will be a new law. Ah, we discovered that this, when you do that, uh, and you don't need this, it won't be changing laws. Of course. We need something like a brute fact. But it's always brute fact in the mosaic, but yeah. in the best system. Yes. Better? Yeah. Okay. Poor Juliette. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Governism. Okay, there's a, it's, it's one of the biggest part of the paper. It's the longest part of the paper, so I will be very short. <laughs> because we explore many, many ways. So there's two main.
main way to get changing laws in Armstrong. Or the, the, the necessity relation change among the same universals. Or you have a system subjected to a change of properties but conserve is, uh, is identity. And so there's a certain sense to say the, the laws change. I will not discuss the second one. We explore the second one and I think it doesn't, it's too costly for Lewis, for Armstrong. I will just explore the first one. And first a remark. We will presume of something epistemologically that I will not justify, but I will argue that we do it, okay? We will just presume it's true. So because there's a difficulty when you distinguish, contrary to the mosaic of facts, which is fixed, you want to distinguish what is related to necessity, what is not, because there's an explicit difference between contingent and necessary in Armstrong. And you have to always be able to make the difference practically. Example, I have, I have a gas in a box. I should have brought a box. A gas in a box, you can see that it's governed by certain necessity relation among its universals, its properties. I open the box, the behavior change quite radically. We won't say there's a change of laws. We'll say there's a change of initial condition or boundary condition because we know how to make the difference between the fact that the contingent facts open and close the box and the laws of nature changing. I will presume that this distinction is always possible because if we don't do that, the problem becomes untractable. It's so complicated to know when laws change if we cannot know when <laughs> it's the condition of the universe that changes. So I will presume it's possible but you have to, this is a very difficult problem to make sense of these theory of metaphysics in real physical case. Because physicists are not that clear about what is a change, you know, that is a change of laws or a change of the initial condition of the universe. And sometimes you would, you would like to say that the initial condition of the universe are almost law-like. So I will presume it's always possible. Okay, always possible. I don't know how to make the distinction, but we can do. Okay, two cases that we have to explore. First, the change between two situations of root facts. So I have the same properties, the same universal. They are governed in a certain way. They are behavior in a certain way. And after a time, on the same system, they do something else. They do something else. Okay. If, it's, if it happens once, okay, but if it happened once or if it's not predictable, Armstrong would say, yeah, but there's a problem because if you have a regularity, if you have something causally capture, it should be captured by, by my theory, because my theory has been designed to capture regular change. So if it's regularly happening, it's problematic, because the same property seems to... Remember, the, the laws are in virtue of the properties of the universal, so the same universal seems to change radically. If it happens once, maybe it's a miracle, but if it's happened more than once, it's a problem. So the second way to see it is to, it's to go to a higher level. A miracle? Yeah, it could be a miracle in the Lewis sense. Something that happens once and it's not explained by the mosaic of We're not talking about Lewis here. Yeah, but it, it, for I'm sorry, it would be the same. If you have... You uh, lost miracles? No. He's talking about a book or quasi-universal. He's talking about, he, he wants to, to make even the thing that should not be model, uh, that you should not be able to model, to model in the theory, because the theory is supposed to explain all causal relations. So if, if for example, you know, uh, 
I have this and it's re reproducible. So uh, I have an electromagnetic system. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no. the, the, automatically, I'm strong will go to to the higher level. Yeah. And would say, no, I, I, I cannot stop there. You know, what's the point? I have to go here. Yeah. I have to say, OK, this change must be governed by a relation between uh, universal of higher level. So L N A is the, the law, the universal associated to this law. This is universal associated to this law. And there is an assistation relation I put N2 here. Because a priori, it's not obvious that it's the same M. It's the same kind of necessity because it's, a, it's not universal describing the, the first level natural property. These are universal at a higher level. Okay, if you put another hand, uh, Rodrigo, Roberto, Rodrigo, Rodrigo had a very typically metaphysical argument. He said, but if it's another hand, how do I know it's an assisti? I know it's an assisti because it's itself an instance of a more general concept. So if the, I have two necessity, I need a third one to be able to see these two necessity as instance of the third one. But yeah, but if I have a third one, how do I know it's a necessity? And to infinitum, um, that's a typical metaphysical argument that, that it's not cool to have a lot of stuff. On the other hand, I think it's easier to just uh, to see that without the, the argument of, at a higher level, that he, here are it, it's maybe a higher level of universal, but it's still related to physical. Because here it's the dynamics of F and G. So here it's it's a higher level, but it's still physical. If we believe that physics is coherent, or science is coherent, and the behavior is coherent, it should be the same kind of necessity related to different dynamics, because it, we're still talking about the same universal downstairs, the same F and G. Okay, but once we have that, there's a question. It's quite uncomfortable to have the same universal exhibiting different laws, but these laws are itself governed by something higher without there's something incoherent that the fact that you have to go to the second level. Uh, how do we say that? It's not obvious, even if it's the same N, why there should be at the, the first level the same properties governed by different different laws. Even if there's a meta loss. Because it's governed, so you have to go and there should be some kind of causal relation. So there's two possibilities. Or we weaken N, or we weaken the universal. And what if you look at Armstrong, when Armstrong is faced with that kind of problem, of the, not exactly the same, but problem where universal could change different location, for example, the easiest way is not to touch to the necessity, it's to go to quasi-universal. So why did we think it was it was the same properties changing? Because it was not the same properties. The electromagnetic properties here are not exactly the electromagnetic properties here. They are still in the same category, but they were different instances of a more general electromagnetic properties mm -hmm. universals. So you go to quasi-universals. And you have a notion of changing laws. Of course, for a metaphysician, this is not changing laws. It's just saying that you just get the laws, <laughs> not changing again. But from the scientist's position, that would be changing yeah. laws. Oh, I have certain electromagnetic behavior in certain condition. I put the thing in a certain specific condition, governed by this, and I get a new kind of electromagnetic phenomenon. But it's still electromagnetic because it's 
governed by an adult. Okay. Yes. So why would it be governed by a mental law? I mean, can't it just like hocus pocus change? It could be what? Like hocus pocus? All of a sudden change? Like, yeah. Why I if it's that there would be something regular behind it? If it's not, if it's not regular, if it's if the change happened once and it's not reproducible and it's not possible to do anything to to convince yourself that it could be again the same, yeah, you would not do this key. You would just say brute fact. But that 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 would be. That would return to a Lewis case. There's a sudden change, no unexplainable whatsoever. You could still do a induction over the disjunctive property or something like that. Or that. Yeah, but if it's not governed by, by a law here, it's not even here that you will put this two in this as quasi universal, the same universal. Would you say these are still electromagnetic properties if, if you don't have this regularity of changing re of nomological regime? Maybe you would say, okay, now they become something else. If it's something else, mm. it's another case. It's not a case of, uh, it's a different case. Because if I have a system, okay, if I have a system, and suddenly I say, yeah, I have a system. And I say, look at the system. I put the blind. I, I, I have a system. I put a blind. Okay? And after that, you say, I put it. And you say, aha, changing. And you would say, no, no, it's not the same thing. It's just a thing that became, that was replaced. It's not change. So you need a certain continuity. And this continuity is true properties of the same kind. It's, it's why dynamical change is important compared to just the position of change or change different at different place. Should think different at different place. It's not change. Is there a good systematic theory of quasi-universals? No. Okay. Probably. <laughs> Armstrong is, 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 is entertaining the fact. Yeah. Because I, I, mean, I, I remember know, reading this back. As back I don't program. know. There's maybe things, but I don't know if there's a systematic yeah. theory of quasi-universal. Nobody, nobody really thinks it's because like, it, useful. Except I'm strong. <laughs> but but it, it will be formally difficult because you need to provide the condition of identity mm -hmm. and the condition of change. Mm -hmm. Because you need to say they don't look the same, but they are the same properties. And this one are, don't look the same, and they are not the same properties. They are not the same quasi-universal. Uh, uh, and that, that's not easy to do. It would need to maybe to have some kind of indexical instantiation of universals, which is, to my knowledge, does not exist, but should be done in a certain sense. Alexander, uh, one, one question. But I have to say, Lewis is serious. I know Lewis. I'm sorry, he's serious. He says, well, quasi universal, maybe the world is like that. You know, there's, it would be more, much more complicated, but maybe the world is structured like that. In, in this case, uh, in which uh, the laws change, all the other conditions are kept the same. I mean, it's. Uh, the, the other laws does not change. Yeah. Yeah, but every. I mean, it's still hard to mean not to see it like like a situation in which no, you, you are changing. No, no, it's not spontaneous change. Oh, no, but it's, you it's can not, no, either. I mean, you are not changing the the domain, for example. I mean, in the sense that, for example, I I I I, I can, you know, grab your, your your keys and just throw it to the floor, and I'm gonna see there's regularity that when when I just leave, leave the keys, they are gonna to fall down many times. But of course, if I do the same in the, in the space, it's not going to come down. But I, it's not that the law is changing. Yes, but, but I mean, can always I the same, make the difference between laws and initial condition. Okay, okay but in that case, <laughs> so we can say... It's because, oh, okay. it's because magically we can do that. Okay, I don't know how. Okay, 
So I would say, oh, in the case of space, its conditions are different. But they are but the laws are the same. Yeah, but the, the, in, the, in this case, the, yeah. the law is, is the same. I mean, yeah. Yeah. The, the same reason why my, my, your yes. keys are falling here yes. is the same way. But also, I mean, if you accelerate some, some, some particle and you see yes. some, some, some yes. decays, for example, and you say, okay, this is, I can describe that situation through a law, but I could also just accelerate it even, 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 yes. even faster, and I'm probably going to see other decays. So, um, yes. But I mean, in that situation, it's not the change, it's not the law that is changed, you are changing just the, yeah. now, all, all the conditions. In this case, are we are presuming that you are able <coughs> to, to show that it's not a change of initial condition for the same laws. Okay, so it, it, to, to, to get it right, it's, it will be the situation in which I am, I am throwing your, your keys here every day and at some point I'm doing the same and one day I just start to uh, go up. So something, um, something like, like that. Be, there but there that will be a general change. Yeah, what, the example of, of uh, Armstrong gave some quasi-universal maybe, maybe would help. It's John's, John's garden. So, John's garden, it's a garden <coughs> somewhere. I don't remember the details, but there's a, there's a wall. Each time you take an apple and it enter in John's garden, it become a peach. There's no apple in John's garden. Each time you take a peach mm -hmm. in John's garden, it become an apple when it goes out. Systematically, all the time. Yeah. Never exception. Extremely regular. There's no apple in George Garden ever. Mm -hmm. But each time you take an apple and you do all kind of condition, you throw that, you do a pie, you do all kind of, they all become peach, peaches. Okay. And the reverse is true. So we would say this is not just initial condition. It's it's really property the, the, the rules change in John's Garden. Yeah but I mean no, no, I think that that's not very fair. I mean in the sense that the, 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 the law there is that, I mean, always that you want to enter an apple into the Gordon, Gordon Garden, it's going to, became, to become a, a, an, a pear or, or, or whatever. But that, that, that's the, 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 the law in this case, it's this regularity. It's not existing no, 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 no. apple say, one say, one one say or not. No, 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 it's a meta-regularity because because it's not <coughs> governing the natural properties of what is governing Apple. It's very stable in the world. We can do all kinds of experiments. The laws governing peaches are, we can do a lot of stuff. But it's, it's a change of nomological regime. So it's, it's governed by a metal law. Mm. Okay, but I, I it's a case. Yeah. I think the best case would be a case of diachronic emergence. If you want my opinion, is that if you have quantum electrodynamic here mm -hmm. and qu a quantum fluid here that is governed uh, by different electromagnetic quantum laws and it's regular and we can reproduce it in laboratory as many times, but, but there's an incompatibility with the laws here and the laws there. That's a better case. Yeah, but anyway, how is not that just a change of the, again, the, the dominion? I mean, it says that you are just changing something in the way in which you are applying the laws, and then, okay, you are going to have different. Yeah, priorities. but your question is epistemological. It's not a metaphysical question. It's how do we recognize these cases? And I agree, it's, I don't know. I don't know, you know, how, <laughs> I don't know, how, how, how do you recognize that we are in, 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 so again, in this case, okay, where so these are quasi-universal, okay, related to a quasi, compared to, oh, maybe we were just wrong about the properties in Apple and completely, we were just wrong. Okay, but by the same token, that I don't know, by the same token, we wouldn't know if we are in a, in a world in which, Newtonian mechanics is Newtonian mechanics is the the the, 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 the Newton's second law is true, but it becomes something like the Schrodinger equation at a 
at a and certain scale. With and, the certain so it's not that one, certain one condition. mechanics is the true theory. It's just the the Newtonian mechanics becomes yeah. quantum. You are, you are going to that, that's okay. a good that's a good case. Okay. If, if there was uh, some conditions okay. where the world become the world that is classical, certain condition of energy side mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. become quantum all the time, mm -hmm. which is much much complicated because of the measurement problem. But, yeah, yeah, but, it's but the all the time, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. That may be a case like that. Okay, okay. Okay, okay so I've been talking a long time. I'll try to accelerate. Okay, uh, so essential dispositionalism is super hostile to changing laws. So we thought that we could not invent something that is plausible. And I am here to present a very strange argument <laughs> of Palm phrase, but we, we, we all signed behind, we all said, okay, yeah, then after working with Palm, but only Palm could think about something like that. <laughs> And it, it, it's very clever, but very weird. So, because it's, it's a theory that is really against changing laws. <laughs> it's, it's essential dispositionalism is really against it. So to do the demonstration, we'll, we'll work on a toy model. Okay, let's imagine that Hooke's law, the, the law of springs, is a fundamental law. So springs are like, quantum fundamental stuff in, in physics today. So it's a fundamental law. It's not, it's not a composition of other laws, okay? Just, just for, for the, that is fundamental in the world of it. This law asserts that the extension of a spring is proportional to the applied force. That, that's just the law, the Hooke's law. We will also presume, which is not acceptable for every dispositionalist, that we can identify what to be a spring, the universal to be a spring, and the universal special extension, and the universal force, independently of the Hooke's law. So I can say it's a spring, even if I did not test that they are spring <laughs> in the sense of the Hooke's law. Not all dispositionalists would accept okay, but for the example with. So let us suppose we can identify springs and extension independently of the Hooke's law. Okay, so in our world, in world W, the Hooke's law takes this specific form. Let us call this law L. Let us suppose that in another world, very close to our world, one finds a similar spring a similar extension, blah, blah, blah. And the Hooke's law is a little bit different. It's another constant. So, dispositionally, if we apply the same stimulus, we don't get exactly the same manifestation because it's a little bit different. So, according to a very strict dispositionalist, would say, it's not the same law because it's not the same disposition because it's not the same manifestation for the same stimulus. Okay, so a very strict dispositionalist would say, it's not the case. Let's imagine now we are not as strict. We're not as strict dispositionalist. We want to make a difference between very different disposition. We'd say if it's just a, a little bit difference in the in the constant is a is a dependent it's a it's a little bit difference in the condition the initial condition but it's still a, sim a very similar disposition okay let's now make the thing a little bit weirder so now let's suppose that one final law of the form kit x2 So again, the strict, the strict dispositionalist would say, yeah, it's complete. No, it's, it's not the same stimulus, the same thing. But the one that accepted before that, okay, there could be diff 
not exactly the same manifestation if I include a little bit more information about initial condition in my disposition. Would, it, would he or she says it's the same? Depending of what kind of disposition it is you find, some, some would say, okay, no, it's still the same. So in that case, because qualitatively it's the same. Or they would say, no, no, when, when it's x2, it's quantitatively too different, even if qualitatively it's the same. Okay, yeah. Why is it qualitatively the same? Because it's still proportion, uh, it's still a, a dependence, a direct dependence between extension and force. Okay. I'm not sure I master what the <laughs> metaphysicians call a qualitative compared to a quantitative. <laughs> but for them, qualitatively, if I have extension and another stuff, and it's always the same, even if it's a different uh, factor, like square, it could be the same qualitatively, but not quantitatively. No, it's not the same for the strict dispositionist, it's never the same anyway. Each time each time we have the same stimulus manifestation that is not exactly the same, it's not the same disposition. That's the strict. But you we could have, at least in principle, if this example is not completely crazy, you still have essence about qualitative relation that differ quantitatively. So if I can identify springs and blah, 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 independently of Hooke's law, I agree that the essential part is only the qualitative relation and not the quantitative one. I could have the same disposition qualitative that change quantitatively between, at least in principle, between two situations. And that, for us, is the best a disposition essentialist can do to have changing laws. If you think it's too, it's too strong paid, it, it's too costly, okay. You know, disposition that excludes changing laws. But it's the minimal change we could find to have something that looks like changing laws, at least quantitatively and not qualitatively. Because, of course, if you change the essence of things qualitatively, you're not in essentialist dispositionalism anymore. I didn't get the result. The difference between the first case with the k to k prime? The first case, the first case is that, okay, in each case, the strong dispositionalist will say no. Okay, because the same stimulus, different manifestation completely different. The first case was to make you more agreeable to, to at least nuance the fact that you could say, yeah, there could be different manifestation, but it's still mostly the same. And why is it not enough? That was a convincing case, but then the square thing? Ah, uh, yeah, but the, the first is not it's a not changing loss, it's a change of the initial condition. It's a change of uh, the way you build the disposition. Okay. The second one is supposed to push you a little bit <laughs> towards, ah, maybe it's not explainable just by initial condition. Yeah. I think if you're an essentialist disposition, it's not going to change. But if you, if you want change in laws, it's the best you can do. I don't know, you might have a similar case as for the... I don't see the big difference between with the government and the government. Because the there's, there's very strong argument against meta-disposition. Um, That's why you cannot have like the... But the disposition might be actually a real disposition, not a meta-disposition. Yeah, but if... Disposition if to change 
is. But if, okay. But that is maybe if maybe you maybe. have a, a change of disposition that is regular enough, and you you want to explain dynamics in the world by the action of disposition, essentialist disposition, you will need a disposition that a certain way represent this change of dispositional regime, mm -hmm. which is a meta disposition. If it's a meta disposition, there's a good argument that they cannot be, it's a flat ontology disposition. Is, you cannot have meta. So if you, it's not governed by a meta disposition, it's governed by something else. It's, 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 it's maybe a byproduct of the action of disposition at the first level. If it's a byproduct, it's, on, it, it's in the manifestation, it's in the disposition. So it's not, it, it should be already there. So it cannot change. It, because the, the manifestation to be, to appear to change this position should be a manifestation of the disposition. Mm -hmm. It's in the disposition itself. <coughs> so there's no change. I mean, it looks like change, but it's no change. The, it, it's, it's yeah, it's not convincing, I know, but you know, <laughs> it's the best we can do. It's absolutely right that if you have a disposition and you, you, you have some manifestation and always you could expect that always it could be the case. But you also have in the uh, disposition, in ontology, all these very, very complicated real uh, uh, masters, mimickers, and uh, disposition interviewing each other, uh, things, yes. something like that. So uh, in, in different cases, someone could say, okay. Yeah, I mean, this is the disposition, but now we have a different law because there's um, no, other, um, another disposition yeah, no, okay. or a masker that is, is, okay. is impeding the disposition. You're right, place. you're right. It's true that if you have a bunch of disposition together doing something, and at, at the level of universal, like biological universal, it could, it could look like changing because it's the same fundamental disposition, but organized differently. Uh, we exclude this case. Mm -hmm. We are only working at the fundamental level. But of course, you're right. It's probably more plausible to to explain, for example, evolution change with disposition based on yeah, the way the disposition are organized is different enough that at the level of observation, it looks like different regularities. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That, yeah. That, but that that. Yeah, no, you're right. It's an interesting case. It's just that we did not work okay, okay. Mm -hmm. at that level. Okay, so conclusion. It will be very fast. Mm -hmm. If we have such a kind of change in the mosaic, specifically disjunctive best system, difficult, not difficult for inductive reasoning because there's, if we were able to to anticipate from this region to the other one, it would not be a disjunctive the system. So, <laughs> this it's still an epistemological uh, epistemological uh, challenge, but they have hope. If these change are regular enough for us to identify the meta law and to be able to to guess that we, we are facing quasi-universal, we can accommodate a cer certain change, certain change, if they are regular enough, empirical enough. Uh, we could restore our confidence. The, of course, the first time we saw these cases, it would be, oh my God, what is happening? <laughs> what should we do? The laws of nature seems to change. But if we can have a certain empirical control because they are governed. We could be able to restore some confidence in inductive reasoning. Of course, here it's more problematic because yes, there will be a, quanti a qualitative continuity, but such a non-regularity at quantitative level that, uh, that uh, if they are brute facts, if they are not explainable by a meta laws, by a meta disposition or by something very regular, for example, people that accept more than an essential disposition, they accept also categorical properties. Uh, there's, there's, 
there's a lot of problem, a lot of difficulties to 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 surmount, to overcome, overcome to restore the principle of induction. So, conclusion: if you want to have changing laws in a certain sense, and still be confident in prediction and things like that. A, a theory that explicitly allow for meta laws, like the quasi universal version of Armstrong, is exactly what you need. Without surprise, because because there's meta laws, the fact that there's no obvious way to have meta laws in Armstrong in Lewis because it's a it's it's a same deductive system describing a plain mosaic of fact. And the fact that this position also is a plain ontology makes that if there's such a change, a change of homological regime, we are not that confident that the principle of induction is compatible with this changing phenomenon. That's it. Beer time. Yeah, but singularities are not okay. Singularities are, are uh, the horizon is not just a point, so it's no, no. so it's not a good measure. No, but the singularities itself are much zero. If you have like it, yeah. If you don't have a cosmic centership, it would see something. Yeah, but still, still, there you have phenomenon. If we had only general relativity and no quantum stuff, yeah, that's a, yeah. maybe I would be inclined to agree with you. But because we we have other kind of phenomena that that are on the horizon of what happened to singularities, that seems to change the game, the rule of the game. I am less inclined to see an analogy with this case that is very formal. It's just a proof of existence. But if we had only only relativity and no other quantum stuff <laughs> on the frontier, maybe. So relativity in itself is not a flawed theory. It's a fact that uh, no, but relativity relativity is a, is a flawed theory because there's other kind of physics. Yeah, but uh, if everything was governed by relativity at a certain scale and we were completely happy with that. Yeah, but it's because yeah. relativity does not work work well at the beginning of the university, yeah. and there's also quantum phenomena at the frontier that we can that we can at least have prediction. It's not just we don't know what happened yeah. inside the blah blah blah. So yeah. Okay. Why does the measure is always important? But it's important to be sure that the best system, you know, it, it will still be the, be the same system. Because if the zone is very wide, where there's a different physics, obviously the, the previous best system is not applicable.
when these meta laws uh, get involved, it seems that you need other inductive principles. Um, <coughs> so you induce <coughs> meta laws rather than laws, or both of them, uh, but you need to distinguish them. And if you do hardcore induction uh, without like opening up to this possibility and, and then like a formal possibility, formal difference between uh, the two kinds of laws, two levels, maybe more levels than two, I don't know. <coughs> uh, the induction is going to go wrong on a formal level, it seems. Of course. Uh, so it's not the principle of induction no, no, that is no. safe, but. No, no, Any it's uh, it's because uh, yeah, I present that in in a metaphysic conference where we discuss of the principle of induction. But of course, if I if I have a strict Bayesian system and I can and I don't take it account normally in a strict Bayesian system, I don't go to no. a higher level. It will fail yeah, until right. it sees enough of this regularities. Mm -hmm. To build another base, to blah, blah blah. Absolutely, yes. But if you build another base, and it seems to get rid of the of the problem, of the changing laws, <laughs> yes. And then basically, yes, addictive. yes. Yeah, you're right. And I was also wondering, in the deductive system case, couldn't you? Of course, this was not what David Lewis was thinking of, but um, I mean. There's no, this is purely syntactic, right? Mm -hmm. The system to it might just have two levels too, or three levels, or it, it's like. Yeah, um, I, I have an, another. Sort of second order. Uh, we were discussing that. I was an, I have another paper where, where it's still under um, under review, where I discuss, could you have meta laws in the best system? Mm -hmm. There's a part of the paper about that. Okay. Because the best system says nothing of what is in the action. Is it facts? Is it first level laws? Is it meta laws? Is it the best system is the best system. It's, it's a list of stuff, finite, with deductive rules. That's it. We have no idea what are in these, except at one point they have to talk about the properties, the natural properties, but how is it that the... The best system is just saying there's a finite list. And you could ask yourself, what kind of stuff could be there? What kind of stuff? And you could say, okay, maybe there's facts, maybe there's first level regularities, you know, which is something that really expands on. Maybe there's meta stuff. Nothing is excluded a priori. But there's some cons constraint when you think about it. One of, for example, if you have a Laplacian, a Laplacian, if, if it's sufficient for the best system to have a Laplacian deterministic deductive system. So you have a certain number of facts and certain number, number of differential equations with time, and it's enough to predict most of the what you need to predict. You know that in this system, adding a meta law would be redundant because it would be an automorphism of the same model. But if you don't have such a system, let's just imagine we have, we, there's no way to describe the mosaic without some probabilities. Or there's no way to describe the mosaic without some, some part that we don't know, so some stochastic aspect. Or maybe there could be in the list of axioms something that looks like a metalog. It will relate to different models of the same basic other part of the of the of the system that that's that's possible but there could be no there surely if we are very careful about what could be a best system we could surely exclude some things but but a priori the best system is anything that is that is deductively powerful enough so there could be very meta principle there if if it if they do the job But they must not be redundant. That's the point. Yeah, I wanted to ask about, this was really cool. I wanted to ask about, I don't even think it's a tension. I just think it's, it's like a, it, 
So you said at the end, and I'm but this is this is what this is what made me think of this. You said at the end, like, oh, you know, in some sense, this isn't very surprising, right? That that to make this work, you need metal walls. But I actually want to like I want to push on because on the one end, I think it's exactly right. Like, okay, sure, you know, if you want to be able to do induction across law change, you need metal walls to guide that. On the other hand, this is there, there might be kind of a, a, a sort of backwards way to phrase that that is a little surprising, which is. You know, you guys did all this work in that other paper to try to find these, you know, minimal interventions on these systems of laws that could make something that looked like a good replacement for changing laws. And there's a sense in which the conclusion that you get to hear when you think about induction is like, yeah, nice try. Uh, but no, like if you want change, if you want to be able to do induction across changing laws, you don't need these like fake changing laws. You need like real, metaphysically, yeah. really real, exactly the thing that you were saying in the beginning that like you were hoping you could avoid having to say like, oh no, it's just actually a serious change of law. That's that seems to be what you really need, right? Yeah, uh, I know it's it's well said. This paper I'm working on shows how wrong my previous paper was. <laughs> Because at least I thought that at least in our previous paper we were changing so minimally the thing to keep the metaphysics sound but make the scientists happy. They say, oh, okay, I, I see how it's but, compatible with what I see. It's changing wrong. wrong. It just means it has a it has a it has an unfortunate consequence that you did not realize <laughs> at the time. Yeah, uh -huh. but this unfortunate consequence is bad enough <laughs> that maybe it's not the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So there, the answer is yes. Is there another question? Yeah. I don't. I wouldn't make a fool of myself if I try to to enter the technical discussion. So just just ask, why would you? What do you want to say with the principle of induction? I mean, why don't you buy the you may because you don't think you're convinced by what you present? So why yeah, no, you, you may there, have there's. If, you're absolutely right. There's other ways to discuss induction in a very epistemological way, and, or we have a, a certain bias towards regularities, and so we go to. Re there's all kind. Absolutely. To discuss induction, even in the worst case, and say it's not so bad. <laughs> but, but what is interesting is that this principle of uniformity of nature that seems to have played a role inside the history of science for hundreds of years, in a form or another, or it was the university of uniformity of God for action of God in Descartes or this analogy of nature, which is a very strong notion in Newton, or in Mills, this principle of uniformity of nature, they always seem to have a connection between why, why can we do science? Because the world is, is such and such. And these metaphysical theory of laws were supposed to do that. They were, of course, the main idea was to discuss counterfactuals. Discuss There's all kind of things they wanted to do with this theory to, to explain metaphysically, to have a, a ground, a metaphysical ground to explain a lot of the practice. But of course, it should be compatible with the fact that science is inductive and working pretty well. So it's why. But on the other hand, you know, probably the good answer to inductive worriness is surely not metaphysical. It's maybe more in, in the practice, in the way we concentrate our research on the part of the world that seems to fit, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Maybe we have a bias, you know. We were discussing that this morning, you know, the physicist Wigner, who won the Nobel Prize for the introduction of group theory in quantum mechanics. So the more meta law you can imagine, you know, everything was coming from the meta explicitly says, yeah, but you know, there's laws and there's non-laws. We are interested in that part. Who knows if the majority of the world is maybe chaotic and non-nomological at all. But this is not what we are interested in. 
So maybe it's a selection bias. In fact, the principle of induction works just because we select for the phenomena where it works. That, that, that could be a very neo-Kantian <laughs> answer. I, I'm putting this paper in a certain context of people that believe that metaphysics is the answer to ever, uh, almost every problem. <laughs> but, but, you know, you're right. The last proposal certainly seems true in psychology. Hmm? The last proposal certainly seems true in psychology. <laughs> but but we the, want to discover all but, this. But these these idea that that we concentrate on certain subjects and not on other, or we project certain things on the world and it fits more or less and it justify our practice. It's not ridiculous when you look at the history of science too. So it's. I think these neo-Kantian conventionalism very seriously. I think they, maybe they, they are absolutely right. On the other hand, there's a there's a lot of things that seems regular because of and why I believe that not because of science, because of technology, the stability of technology, the rely the 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 fact that technology survived to dramatic theoretical change. So there's something in the action in the world that seems robust, at least in our scale, at our scale of the world, in this region of the universe. Combining those last two answers, right, could give you, a, 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 I think, a better answer to that question of the relationship between this and the last paper, right? So it's not just that the last paper was wrong, it's that you're mapping the like, every move here has a philosophical cost. Mm -hmm. And you're mapping the cost structure, philosophically speaking, right? So, I mean, because one of the, I guess, you know, we, we, could always, we could always take two steps farther back and underline, so the other, the other option that remains here is to double back and reject a different premise, which is now we can go back to the physicists and say, guys, uh, stop talking like there's changing laws. Oh, yeah. Like, knock it off. Like this is this just doesn't. There's too the the costs for that move are too high. Too costly. The costs for that move are too high. Get over it. Knock it off. Um, maybe that you know and like so that's always you know there's always there, there's there's you, you can you can play with each of these independent variables a little bit right. And I think that's I think that's kind of a cool way to think about it. Maybe so maybe induction is the variable to play with right. Maybe the this, the nature of the laws is the variable. But maybe the physics is the variable to play with. But like. That's kind of a neat, you know. It's it, it's 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 really cool to see how all these things are how they're interrelated in that way, right? Uh, thank you for the suggestion because I always trust scientists more than, <laughs> than philosopher, and so I presume that when they are talking about let's explore the possibility of changing laws, they have good reason for it. I think, I think but, but maybe maybe if. One of these theories of metaphysical law, so we have to believe that they are a good approach of the metaphysics of law, show that it's too costly. Yeah. It's yeah. surely enough to be worth exploring, you know. Yeah, but are people against integrating with this kind of stuff? If you believe that it's too much of a cost to change those, why we actually believe in the street breaking? Because street breaking is a easy case where you have two different kind of set of laws that are supposed to Yeah, but spontaneous symmetry breaking, you could always say yeah, but these are a regime of a meta law called the end theory. Yeah, that's, that's the point. But you, you can say that you need, you need the meta laws to do You need the meta laws. Okay, so okay, yeah. So they are yeah. not spontaneously interacting the instance of the But I didn't want to. This is a. This idea, when they discuss about the M theory and all that, and in fact, there's, there's this theory in general, and there's all these different regimes that seems really different. It's, it looks like philosophy. So it, yeah. we have no idea what is the M theory. We have no, no clues that what it is. We have uh, evidence for asymmetric breaking at the start of the year. Yes, but, but not that, that it's a sign that there's a more general stuff. No, but I mean, if you, if you believe in metaphysics, that cosmology should be taken seriously, ontologically speaking, you have an argument against saying that it's uh, generally two different kind of law, set of laws and there is no overarching principle. Because there should be one, because otherwise, metaphysically, there is an issue. Mm. So you should be Armstrongian. 
if you, sociologically taking all this, I mean, uh, speaking of like taking all this seriously and how we should react to it, I mean, I'm, I, I read all of this stuff in 2006, so it's been a very, very long time. Um, <coughs> are people, you know, does the existence of these kinds of cases and things like M theory and you know, are people taking more seriously? Because I remember the meta law discussion. There was like a there were like a couple of articles poking it when are like that that one bit of Armstrong where he talks about it some and like is that are people in, picking in, this up in the metaphysics tradition? There's not a lot about that, mm -hmm. to my knowledge. No, okay, I, I don't master all no. metaphysics. Sure, sure, sure. To my knowledge. But of course, in science, there's always been discussion about yeah. level of laws yeah. and, and principle of invariance, are they laws, or principle of conservation, are they meta-laws, or constraint over the laws we can build, and, and even is uh, biological laws mm -hmm. a constraint on the physics thermodynamics of the being, or the thermodynamics is a constraint on biological laws. There's always discussion of different nomological regimes in science. I guess you've got Mark Lang stuff, but that's metaphysically but, to swallow for different But reasons. in metaphysics, uh, to my knowledge, there's not a lot about that. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it's, it's tough, you know. There's good arguments, so there's strong arguments that it's very difficult to explain the relation between a law, even in Armstrong, and its instance. Okay, why it governed? There's something non-temporal here, there's something temporal there, it's causal here, blah, blah, blah. If you had a level like that, it's just making all the problems of Armstrong much worse. Much worse. To the point that some metaphysician would say, okay, it's not... It's no, done. Right. It's done. I'm no, sure it's done. Let's do this position. It's one level. It works. Uh, so yes. Yeah. So, so I'm not surprised that they did not explore systematically that kind of hierarchy for a good reason, because it makes the theory weaker. On the other hand, there's a famous exception. Lange. Yeah. The theory of laws of Langer is built to have a hierarchy. It's built to do it. It's explicit. It's all designed to be able to make sense of the how physicists talk about the level of, of the logical level. But it's a very specific, unique, interestingly weird theory. Um, yeah, my name. May I ask why you didn't mention this? Because, because I wanted to talk about the three standards. Yeah. The three standards. Of course, there's other interesting. There's primitivism that is very more and more popular. There's uh, where the dynamical principles are not explained by anything. They are just there. There's uh, Lange that is always a candidate around, even if it's such a bizarre approach that it's different. You have to buy tough things about non-contextuality of counterfactual facts, which is difficult to buy. And there's other, there's of course, uh, one of the reviewer always say divine decree. Mm -hmm. A law is a divine decree. It's, it has been very popular for thousands of years. <laughs> so, and that you, you can have changing laws. It's the will of God. If you have a God that can change his mind or her mind, the laws can change. If you have a God, a Leibniz God that cannot change, that, that is submit by that has to submit to rationality, the laws cannot change. So of course there's other possibilities. I just put chose these three because they are the more discussed today. But maybe maybe they are not the good one. Maybe you should become a theist. <laughs> I, 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 the idea that there should be a theory of universal, that, that of quasi-universal, that is very well made, that is indexical, that, that has something interesting, that should exist. If we had such a formal theory, it would be much more interesting because we could have 
a, a framework to understand how necessity relation here transform in necessity relation there and we could we could have the conceptual framework to understand the continuity if we had universals that are not these platonistic or uh, or aristotelian stuff that are the same for all eternity and but i don't know how to build this that kind of formal theories it's sort of process on yeah, but process, yeah, could be a process, I don't know, I don't understand process ontology also. I wrote a paper about that, but it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like everything I wrote in my <laughs> it's all, yeah, it doesn't work. I have, I have a question, uh, uh, it's about when you were talking about uh, how Lewis could accommodate the uh, principle of induction. And at some point, you were presenting these five principles mm -hmm. that's the, uh, the, the structure of the human mosaic. And you say something like that those principles guarantee the principle of induction. Among other things. Among other things, yeah. 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 But at some point, I had this, this doubt that some of the principles could be seen as already assuming some kind of principle of induction. Mm -hmm. For example, physicalism. Mm -hmm. you, 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 suppose that you are a human and you say, okay, I, I hold physicalism and I ask you, <coughs> what, what do you mean by physicalism? And you're going to say something like, okay, only uh, material interactions or causal closure or something like that. So what you are saying is that we have this regularity that always material things interact with material things. But how, how, how do you know that in the future probably we are going to have uh, minds that emerge and they start to interact with, with, with the physical stuff. So at some point you're assuming that, okay, the interactions are regular enough to suppose that in the future things are still going to interact with things, but who knows? Mm -hmm. No, no, but you're absolutely right. It's, this is something in metaphysics that, that is difficult for philosopher of science to swallow is that in the metaphysics they built everything they want by hand yeah, yeah so have you're like if there's a mosaic fundamental physical meteorological reduction universals and blah 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 you have everything you want and you say yeah but you just put all <laughs> the consequence by hand they say yeah but disposition Dynamics has been a mystery for thousands of years. Where change is coming from? What is change? It's in the world. It's in the disposition. Do you need to explain change? No. It's in the disposition. Okay? And they would, they would argue, okay, this is extremely bad because this necessitation relation between universal, it's difficult to understand how a necessitation relation between universal that relate to certain kind of properties, connection between property, generate change, which is temporal in the world. So this jump is very fishy in Armstrong because it's not put by hand. It's, it's still a gap. You end up that. It disappeared. <laughs> so, so we should be charitable. The goal of metaphysician is not the same goal as philosopher of science. The goal of metaphysician is to build nice pictures of the world, pictures that help us think and relate problems together. Yeah. But you're perfectly right to say why. <laughs> so. The fact that he had to add this five, we have to add these five things, should be a very good reason to think that the mosaic of facts is doomed. It's just not rich enough to do anything. But Lewis would say, no, no, the mosaic of facts, I have very strong reason to believe that facts are like that in the world. Therefore, since I want to to get to all the interesting results, I have to, to patch the system to make sense. And it's coherent with my is causality, is time travel, blah, 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 blah. Or take the vote of Stolens and say that, you know, 
the mosaic of facts is what we have access to. Science is possible, therefore these five things are true. <laughs> Which is true. I mean, yeah, sometimes, he, sometimes he kind of sounds like Yeah, it. science works. Uh, so the, each, the fact that science works is good reason to believe that there are these five hypotheses are probably true. But then, that, that's the bizarre thing about metaphysical project is that they should stop to say they explain anything because to explain is not to have the answer in the premise okay? yeah. <laughs> it's not the goal the goal is to have a picture that will help you to maybe think about other problems and other things so if you have for example the Armstrong conception of laws and meta laws maybe it would be interesting to think about interesting case where there seems to be regime change with the same kind of properties and okay uh, how would connect to for example my theory of uh, our theory of uh, Olivier and me of uh, transformational emergence maybe it's the right frame to think about transformational emergence the question if it's true or false and whatever it explains You know, disposition will never, never explain change, ever. It's in it. You just put change in it yeah. by hand. So the goal is, we should not ask this theory to do something it cannot do. But it, uh, but, but your your comment is very relevant. Uh, because of this limitation of metaphysical project, I understand why some philosopher would say maybe it's not worthwhile to invest in metaphysics. And yeah, makes sense. <laughs> of course, if you say that to metaphysicians, they don't understand because they believe metaphysics is the center of philosophy. But yeah, maybe not. I find birds interesting. No, yeah, how, yeah. How, far, <laughs> how far can we go with this? If you cannot do everything, putting by hand almost everything that is complicated, it's, a, it's interesting. We learn something. You know, when you read the book of Alexander, and at the end, there's this bizarre <laughs> passage arguing, oh yeah, there's the problem with symmetry. Yeah. <laughs> and, Maybe my theory is incompatible with modern physics, yeah, but mm, probably physics is wrong. We learned <laughs> something. Yeah. We learned something. It's, a, it's going to, to the end of an idea, to the extreme consequence of a metaphysical hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And it forces you to say that actual physics is wrong because it's multi level. And it cannot be in reality. Mm -hmm. And in any case, I, I, I didn't go that far to say that we shouldn't give funding to metaphysicians to do their work. No, no, no. Because but, just much more, much but, we, but we have to put metaphysical projects at the right place. They cannot do more than. Yeah, in this case, I mean, if you yeah. want to justify the principle of induction through this. Five principles seems that you you have to assume at some point the principle of induction. So in that case, it's yeah, it's not giving any justification or explanation of the principle of induction because you already assume it. But the, the gain of Lewis program of laws, I think the main gain is that could you get all the counterfactuals claim without posing in the system some kind of modality power. So at least that 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 that's why it's an interesting metaphysical project from especially for me because he's trying to show that you don't need this position you don't need uh, necessitation connection between universal to get at least if the project works to get to make sense of uh, of uh, the way uh, scientists talk about justifying counterfactuals. Is there any other question or comment? No? We are <coughs> almost time, three minutes. So. <laughs>
Okay, with the minister.